from Las Vegas, it's the, 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 the Tom Likas Show. Listen, fellas, I want more money. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. This is where America gets together to talk about the issues you really care about. It's a different kind of a radio talk program. Where the radio talk show that is not hosted by a right-wing wacko or a convicted felon. No, I am your host. Write down our telephone number. You're going to need it. It's one 800 800 tom 1-800-5800-866. It's Friday and we're in Las Vegas. We're in Las Vegas uh, with the Los Angeles Kings who are playing their annual Frozen Fury preseason game at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. The game is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here in Las Vegas. Many people are coming in from L.A. and Orange County and uh, other places. My God, Denver, all over Colorado. You see all these Colorado Avalanche fans who come to town for this game. You know, they don't get out much in uh, Colorado. So they uh, try to make their way. Well, we're not on in any station in Colorado. What the hell? Screw Colorado. <laughs> and for the four hobbyists who are listening to us online in Colorado, screw you too. <laughs> Please. Anyway, uh, the uh, Avalanche fans are here, and you can always tell us the Avalanche fans, boy. I'll tell you why they fill out those jerseys. Wow. <laughs> tell you what. Just amazing. So anyway, we, we are here for the big game. Uh, we were not here last year because we were in London waiting for the Kings to get to London last year for the uh, opening of the season. But uh, we are back here for Frozen Fury this year. So I'm sure many of the listeners are going to be uh, at this event over the weekend if you're not on the way here now. And it's always uh, a big deal. It's a sellout, and a bunch of people make a weekend out of it, which is what we've done. And and I, I want to tell you, and we've been very good about this, Gary Zabransky, in honor of this big weekend, our big hockey weekend in Las Vegas, he took every bottle of premium booze we were hiding in the studio, and they are lined up in his room. I mean, his room was like a mini bar, but it's the most upscale. This is like top of the line bourbon. What is that? Like 140 proof bourbon you brought there and top of the line rum. Yep. We know knock on Captain Morgan's, but uh, come on. You should get a little of this in you. Mm, baby. And, uh, all these, uh, the Margarita King, all the uh, Margarita King margaritas. I mean, it's all premium stuff. And uh, as soon as I don't have to talk into a microphone anymore, we're all going to go uh, back to Gary's room. And big spenders that we are, we're going to sit in Gary's room, probably play Keno and drink <laughs> drink top-shelf booze. That's our plan. Uh, but uh, it's hockey weekend. What the hell? We got, you cigars, need, we got cigars, too. And uh, with all this booze, you know, when you sit down by the ice... For those of you who don't sit down by the ice, those of you who sit in the 300 level of whatever arena you go to, let me just tell you this. Down by the ice where I sit, it's cold. It's cold down there. You need a little antifreeze before you go down there. Seriously. Whatever how the old school hockey players used to tank up before the game. Where are they now? Those are the days. Anyway, uh, big, uh, it's the big preseason game and it's a lot of fun and, uh, there's, uh, always uh, some excitement and great people watching. Uh, so we're here for that. Uh, later in the hour, speaking of the Kings, Dustin Brown is going to stop by here and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, the hockey season, about the National Hockey League and about the Kings. And, uh, I, you know, I've been a Kings fan now for over 20 years. I'm still sitting down there. Still sitting down there. I still believe something can happen. I'm still down there. That's my deal. I'm, down, I'm, a, I'm right on the glass this year. You can't escape me. I'm right down there. Anyway. Meantime, it's wide open telephones on this Friday here at 1-800-5800-TOM. It's 1-800-5800-866. Let's say hello here. Now, Mike, speaking of hobbyists, uh, Mike is listening to our online stream in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Hello. Hello, Tom. Hello, Mike. Tom, life is great. I'm really glad to be talking to you right now. I 
It's really awesome to be talking to you. Now, now, how did you find out about our show all the way in Montreal? I live in I live in California part time, and I came I come down for the summer now because I don't live here anymore. I'm up in school in Canada, and uh, I hear the, I listen to the Tom Lyke show down there. I love it, and when I come up here, I listen to it up here. It keeps my mind straight and focused. You know. Now you know our show has officially been banned in Canada. Uh, we were on in Vancouver for one glorious half a year. And the radio station went from last place to first place when we came on the air. And then when the CRTC, which is uh, everybody who listens may know by now, the Canadian equivalent of the FCC, uh, when they stepped in and uh, ordered us off the air, the station went from first place to last place. Well, yeah, well, okay, let me explain to you that one. Your show promotes to be single, no girlfriends, no marriages, nothing, right? Right. Okay, well, that's a problem for Canada because our national birth rate is going down like crazy. So they want everybody to get married, pregnant, have 10 kids, but that's a problem with your show, right? It conflicts. Well, yes, that, and I called somebody a retard on the air, and Canadian television can show full frontal nudity, but you can't call anybody a retard. Exactly. Even when they are a retard. Yeah, and there are plenty up here. I'm, I guarantee it. Well, there's nothing like watching those uh, aboriginal, uh, politically correct shows on uh, CBC in prime time. Uh, I love it. <laughs> those, those soap operas with Indians in them. It's it's pretty amazing. Oh, really? It is. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen one of those? Like they're like uh, telenovelas, but they're they're about uh, Native Canadians. Have you ever seen these? They live I... in igloos up there, and they. Uh, I I only see the promos. They don't actually get to see the whole show usually. Oh, no, I, Tom. I kind of strayed away from uh, Canadian television because oh. it, it's, I don't know, it's too swayed. I don't know. I don't like it much. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, uh, what can I say? That did, look, there's a reason everybody wants direct TV and Sirius and XM in Canada yep. so they can escape Canadian television, exactly. radio. It's so It's so left-wing. I don't like it anyway. It's dreadful. Yeah, and uh, Tom. Yes. Okay, you were talking about the ice rinks. Come on, it's not that cold down there. That's because you live in California. I time. do live in California. Not it's that, not I'm, that cold. I'm sure in Montreal it's like getting in from out of the cold, but in Los Angeles that's cold. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else at Staples Center. You know, because it's so hot outside, it's even colder on a hot day because on a hot day they have to turn the uh, the cold up uh, because the ice might melt. Oh wow. So it's I I have been to games in Montreal and New York and Boston and Philly and let me tell you something it's colder in LA <laughs> because if it's eighty five degrees outside they need to turn the air conditioning to a lower temperature. Wow! Think about that. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I know. All right, and uh, well, the reason I'm calling Tom. Is... Oh, but that's not why you called. No, no, not at all, actually. What was the reason you were calling? Okay, I'm a 17-year-old kid, right? Now, okay. the economy in America is not at its strongest point right now. Now, people at this week, you had a topic that they were saying how they were afraid of the market and everything. Tom, for me, I, I don't know if I could go, be going into a better world. It's perfect time for me to start investing in the stock market. I mean, I live at my parents' house right now, and I intend on doing so as long as I can so I can cope with the economic problems, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to, you know, invest, save up my money. I worked as an engineer intern this summer. I have the not a very – I'm not far along in my uh, my schooling, right? Yeah, so, or your dog training for that matter. Yeah, speaking of which, freaking annoying. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, now, you guys can hear all that, can you? Of course. Sorry. <laughs> uh, he seems to have be quiet now, so. No, he'll, he'll be quiet until you get to the point. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Just when you're yeah. about to hit that wonderful arc, where you're I just know. about to make sense, you've got that moment of clarity. And then it's Tom, that's why I don't want a dog when I get out of the house. You understand that? I understand. Is that your parents' dog? They're so. Yeah, it's my parents, and they don't want to get rid of him. He, Poops all over the... Oh, Jesus. Oh, I mean, my. It's making me sick to even think about it. I understand. <laughs> You're smart. You don't have a dog. I respect that so much. 
I don't. I come visit people like you with a dog, and then I go home happy. Exactly, and then they have to walk it. You don't have to walk it. You just pet it. You tell it it's cute, and then, you know, when it starts pooping, they take care of it. And there's nothing like walking the dog in Montreal. You know, the dog needs that one last 9 p.m. walk at night, and it's January, and it's 20 below zero. I wouldn't walk my dog at 12 And you have to walk yeah. out on your uh, aboriginal uh, novella so you can go walk the dog. That's the <laughs> life. Tell you what. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, it's been a little slice of heaven. I really appreciate the call. I really do. And uh, what are we doing here, Gary? Are we, uh, we're bringing Dustin Brown on the show right now. Let's do it. Absolutely. He's here in the studio. And um, we have a very weird setup here in Las Vegas. This is not our regular setup. So I have to like sit like this. If I want to have any chance of eye contact, you can't see me, but I maybe I put the mic over my head. Now that's going to fall. That's great. <laughs> Thanks for a, a nice way to impress the guest. Uh, it's so nice for you to come in. Thank you. I can barely reach the microphone here. But uh, this is CBS, after all, and we spare no expense. We spend it all on CSI. That's what we do. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, it's a new hockey season for you. You're a veteran now. Uh, yeah. It's a different feeling for me. Uh, I'm only 23, but uh, one of the more experienced players on our team. That Now, that's pretty amazing. I think the Kings now are probably the youngest team in the National Hockey League. Is that right? I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I know Pittsburgh has a young squad, but uh, we have to be pretty young. Uh, obviously, our roster is not finalized yet, but uh, we'll be definitely one of the younger teams. Now, what's that like? Uh, you know, you've been scrimmaging with these guys, and a lot of these guys are new, uh, new teammates. Uh, what's that like trying to develop some chemistry? Um, for me personally, it's uh, a little different. Uh, we have younger guys coming in, but for the first time, this is my the fifth year now. It's the first time I've come back and actually have played with some of the guys. We have Kopi, Sully, Fro, uh, Jack. Uh, those are you know guys I've come back in as a group, core group of guys, and you know, for me, that's the first time that's happened uh, since I played here, where I've come back a second season or a third season, have some of the same teammates. Uh, and I look back to my first team, and there's two players from that original team. I'm amazed there were that many. Yeah, it's me. Because there's been a lot of changes. Yeah, yeah, me, Fro, and Army, the only three from my original 2003 team. That's amazing stuff. Now, you had a breakout year last year. This was your best year ever last year. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, playing with Kopi obviously helps. Uh, he's a great player, and, you know, a privilege to play with him. And then, uh, you know, the league's funny. It's... Uh, uh, a lot of experience. Once you get that experience, you kind of learn uh, little things that will, you know, make a big difference. Now, uh, you uh, also, last I looked, and I, I imagine it was true, you, you led the league in hits last year, right? Uh, yep. Uh, I think I was second two years ago, and then this year I ended up leading. Now, um, uh, now uh, 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 Andre Kopitar is a, is a big offensive scorer, but the hits, that's all you. Uh, yeah. From the that's all you. Majority of the time, I mean, he 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 gets a hit every once in a while, but uh, uh, probably not on a consistent basis, uh, game in game out. Uh, there's a few guys that will carry that load. You know, the Kings being on the West Coast and not in the center of the hockey world, so leading the league in hits is one of the ways people find out what's going on in LA with the Kings. Uh yeah, I think. I mean, I've talked to Luke uh, about this, and it's it's kind of like you know, playing in LA, you don't really get noticed until he said it was. You know, hockey was kind of. You know, you never knew hockey was in L.A. until they made it to the Cup, and I mean that's you know part of the battle uh, with playing in L.A. But I mean, with this young core, we could uh, do something special and kind of put L.A. on the map as a hockey town. Dustin Brown plays hockey for the Los Angeles Kings. We're here in Las Vegas, and the Kings are playing their big Frozen Fury game tomorrow night at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. And it's a big thing where people come for the weekend and eat like pigs and drink like fish and watch a hockey game. Well, that's what Vegas is all about, for God's sake. That's the deal here. Now, now, uh, where are you from, Dustin? Uh, Ithaca, New York. Ithaca, New York. Uh, Los Angeles is a long way from Ithaca. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I remember getting drafted and didn't really know where I was going to go. Uh, I was rated high, but at the draft, anything can happen. And when L.A. picked me, uh, I was a bit surprised. I just kind of the West Coast, like I was just talking about, was, you didn't really know there was a hockey team. I mean, you know there was a hockey team, but you didn't know hockey was – a huge thing, and you know, to my surprise, actually, our fan base is uh, ever since my first year has been here. Great. Now, uh, was there an adjustment process to living in Southern California? Uh, definitely. I mean, 
I mean, I lived in Albany, New York for three years myself, and that was enough for the adjustments. I moved around the country, but Ithaca directly to Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, it was definitely different. Uh, just uh, not only the lifestyle and a lot of d- different things coming from the East Coast, but being 18 and having to do it all at 18 was uh, a bit overwhelming, but uh, I got through that first year, and I think it helped me. Yeah, yeah, and now you're the big KG veteran on the team. Uh, funny to say that, I guess. Uh, Isn't that amazing? It's uh, weird how it works, and, you know, I look back, it seems like just yesterday was my first year, and now it's, I mean, there's guys that are older than me that are just getting into the league, and, you know, the way I, I mean, my route to the NHL was uh, unique, and there's, you know, a million different ways, but I got there somehow, and now it's uh, five years in the league, and coming in and being on a veteran, a veteran on a pretty young team uh, at 23 is a unique situation. Now, and you also traveled to all these cities. Uh, had you been to most of these cities prior to joining the the team? Um, with the exception of uh, Toronto, Buffalo. I mean, the cities around where I lived. Uh, I lived in Canada for three years and played hockey up there. So Toronto was 40 minutes away, but uh, not. You know, I hadn't even been past. Uh, West of Chicago until I was drafted. You were not even old enough to drink also that time in the beginning. Uh, no, for three years. Uh, oh, my. Our, my first Frozen Fury, uh, my first three Frozen Furies was, uh, you know, a little difficult. You were you were drinking Frozen Furies over here. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, so, so which is your favorite city to go to? Do you have a favorite? Um, there's a few. Uh, Chicago is one of my favorite cities to go to. Uh, i you know, I know a lot of people there. My agent's from there and just kind of have a network of friends there. So, and obviously the city's fun. Um, Vancouver's always fun. Uh, one, the city's pretty cool and the hockey atmosphere up there is, uh, you know, something different up there. And, you know, it's, uh, that's their number one game and it's always fun to play in, in front of crowds like that. Now, the fans may or may not know this, but you also signed a big long term deal last year. You're going to be around for a long time. Yep, uh, last, uh, you know, about a year from now, a uh, year ago, uh, six year extension. So, uh, you know, I looked at that deal and lo- love playing in LA and especially with the, for, with the guys coming up, uh, Kopi and all these young guys and it's going to be exciting to play here and I want to be a part of it. Oh, it sounds, and uh, do you have fun now, uh, going into, uh, what your fifth year? Is it, is it fun? Uh, yeah, it's definitely fun. Uh, I mean, for, I, I would imagine for most of us, uh, that's what we, you know, you'd, play every day when you're a kid and all you think about is playing in the NHL and I mean a few people get to live that reality and I'm lucky to be one of them wow look at that now I I met your wife before you guys got married and she came to me (laughs) and she told me the following I'll tell you what she said to me she bragged to me that you are not a like us one on one student no you know the thing is is uh, she listened we listened to the show and uh (laughs) She uh, she disagrees with some of the what you say, but half the time she's like, the people that call in are, you know, wrong on ha- more majority of the stuff that you know is discussed. Obviously, doesn't uh, agree with uh, your main staples, but uh, you know, yes, yeah, she made a point of coming up to me and telling me that. Yep, she's uh, you know, she's one of those people. Who, she'll voice her opinion if she has one. She was great. I was like blown away. She she made she made sure to t- she didn't know if we, you and I had met. She just wanted me to know that. Yep, that's how it is. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. Good luck with the new season. Good luck. Uh, you, you'll be introduced to all your teammates, I imagine, by the end of the week. Yep. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Of course, you've met them all. But there's a lot of guys there, right? There's uh, some um, like 40 or 50 guys still, right? Yeah, right now there's 60. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be making uh, you know cuts uh, yeah. probably uh, over the weekend or, yeah. or early next week. Yeah, well, uh, good luck on the season. Good luck uh, to you uh, personally uh, uh, in having another great season because uh, you, know, you really are now uh, the, pretty much uh, uh, one of the faces of the Kings. I mean, really, uh, you and Andre Kopitar and Alex Frolov, I mean, you, you guys are the team. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of, uh, I think, the plan. Uh, you know, we started out uh, a lot of two years ago and trying to get young and, and developing from within and you know, we had three or four players that were already in the system and with me and Kopi and Fro and, and Jack's here now and you have other guys coming up, but, uh, you know, they're looking to us to kind of carry the load and, and be the leaders of this team. Fantastic. Good luck to you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Dustin Brown of the Los Angeles Kings. You'll see him here in Las Vegas tomorrow night at the MGM Grand Arena for Frozen Fury 11. All right. More of your telephone calls coming up as we continue. <laughs> 
1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. What exactly are you in control of? Pretty much the control of the whole hospital for that way. Really? So when she's nagging you, how could she nag you if you're in control? I uh, tell you the truth, that, you know, it's a real hard question to answer, you know? Yeah, because you're lying to me. Let me tell you something, pal. If you're in control of everything, here's what you do. You say to her... Didn't you forget who's in control of everything here, bitch? The Tom Likey Show. It's the Tom Likey Show. Yes. Check your radio dial. That's what it is. It's 1-800-5800-TOM. Here I am in Las Vegas with wide open telephones. Let's say hello here to um, David on the Tom hey, Likas Tom. Show. Yes. How are you? I'm doing great. All right. Uh, actually, I was uh, thinking a lot if I should uh, talk about it on the radio or not. Um, I'm married to... Uh, I come from Israel, right? I've okay. been here for uh, five years already. Uh, I'm married to an American citizen. I'm sure you're familiar with the... Uh, with the uh, scenario, you know. Um, you mean you married somebody to get a green card, or you married somebody and you're hoping to get a green card as one of the benefits? Exactly. No, for just a fake marriage, just to get the uh, papers. Okay. And um, now she is uh, pregnant with their boyfriend. Okay. Right. Uh, we don't we don't live together or anything, and obviously it's just you know just just uh, marriage on the on the papers obviously you know and uh she has a boyfriend and now she's pregnant and she's gonna have that uh baby uh -huh. and uh she i know she plans to she's planning to uh to get a welfare or you know something like that all that stuff i really don't know anything about that um so uh my question is how does that affect me as you know well but have you had any have, have you had any interviews at the INS yet I already got the green card yes oh you've got the green card I did well oh. I got I got the temporary one and I'm waiting you know it's supposed to uh, after two years you get the permanent one so but uh, don't years, you uh, don't you have another interview after this there was an interview I got the temporary one you get it for two years and after two years they want to see that you get that you're still married basically and only after that you get the permanent one, and only after, you know, after that we can get divorced. Now, do you have an attorney? Uh, I do have an attorney. She doesn't know about, she doesn't know it's fake. She thinks it's real. Otherwise, she wouldn't have taken the case, you know. I see. But um, that's, well, the thing is now... Uh, my friends told me about me li being legally responsible for supporting the child or, you know, and if she's not well, getting a welfare, or, I don't know. Did I'm you ask your attorney child. that question? Because I, I'm, I'm not sure myself. I'm not an attorney, but uh, I know there are states, and I thought California was one of them, where if a married woman becomes pregnant, uh, it's assumed that the father of the child is the person she's married to. But, yeah, well, I'm not the father, though. Yeah, but I, when I say it's assumed, that means for legal purposes. Right. How can I get out of it? Oh, it's, geez, well, that's, that's a question for your attorney, and you need one. And you need the attorney to answer that question. I'm afraid to go to an attorney and tell him it's, this whole thing is fake, you know? I mean, I don't know how... how well, they can well first, it. Of all, first of all, an attorney has an attorney-client privilege. The attorney's not going to turn you in. Right. You know, because, believe me, murderers have attorneys, rapists have attorneys, O.J. Simpson has several attorneys. Right. All right, so uh, you, if you want to go to a different attorney and uh, pose your question, then, then go for it. Okay, now, can you tell me more about this welfare thing that you can get for the government, because I really don't understand anything about that. Well, uh, if she applies for welfare, um, uh, the welfare department uh, could say who's the husband, and uh, when they know who the husband is, they can come at you uh, for child support. 
But again, I'm not an attorney, and I recommend strongly that if you're not comfortable going back to the attorney you lied to, uh, that you get yourself another attorney and uh, lay it all out. And don't lie this time. Yeah, but, um, okay, uh, as far as the welfare thing, uh, what if she said she's not married? Because this is a confidential marriage, actually. And uh, we're not registered in it. And nobody you see, has now you, you're asking me questions that really have to go to an attorney. Right. You I'm not an yeah. attorney. I understand. I'm I a understand. guy with a microphone. I'm not an attorney. Don't take my word on this stuff. Go to an attorney. Okay, is that an um, immigration attorney or a family well, attorney? Well, I would start with an immigration attorney, and if the immigration attorney says, I don't know the answer, you may also have to get a family law attorney who may or may not work in the law firm with an immigration attorney. Yeah, but you can at least get recommended to somebody by an immigration attorney. Right, right. But I recommend you do that like before uh, this show is over today. I understand. Should I, I, I should do it before the child was born. Though. Well, you you, know, you should have done this all a long time ago, but uh, you, time is of the essence. I wouldn't be waiting. I understand. Because you want to know something? Her boyfriend knows about you. Uh, no, of course he does. Well, <laughs> so so guess what? If he gets angry about this situation or if he has a problem with it, you never know if he'll turn you in. Yeah, you got a point. So if I were you, I wouldn't F around. I would go get a good attorney or two. All right. All right. Now, now, let me ask you this question. Has it really been worth it to deceive the government and an attorney to get these papers? Well, it was, it was worth it at the beginning, you know, before I found out she was pregnant. I know. mean, overall. Looking back now from today, I don't know the, what the consequences are, but you know, if, if maybe I can get a way out of it. I mean, getting the papers that was my only chance. That was my only, um, my, the only way. Right, I, but that you got all these people now who probably know about you and right. what you did, and what you did was you broke federal law. I know, I know. Well. A lot of people do that. I'm not saying it's, you know, just because a lot of people yeah, do that. Yeah, but who cares what the other people do if if a lot of people know you did it? Somebody might say something. What if I just, you know, if I see that everything is turning against me, I just play it up and, you know, leave the country? How is that going to affect Again, you have no idea. I, again, good question for an attorney. I'd be writing all these down. Yeah, I have plenty of questions I can ask. Good. You. Make a list and go to a real attorney. Don't call a radio personality. Go to an attorney. I know you're a smart man. That's what I called you. <laughs> All right. You. But I'm encouraging you not to cheap out on this. This is your life we're talking about here. You're right. You're right. Hey, do me a favor. Take me out with a bong head uh, followed by African style. All right. Here you go, David. Tom Likas, 1 800 5 800 Tom, 1 800 5 800 866. I think you are the foulest piece of excuse of a human being. Good, I'm glad you feel that way. We're telling our youth. Our young people of America, that they should be treating women like dirt. Yes, and, uh, they should. I feel very sorry for you. It's the Tom Likas Show. <laughs> Tom Likas Show. From Las Vegas. 1-800-5-800-TOM. That is our telephone number. Amy on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hi, Amy. I have got a question for you about the bailout, because I know you're a good money person. 
And my question to you is, I think I'm really fed up with it already. I've got friends who actually are going to short sale their home. But before they do that, they're going to buy a new car because they know their um, their FICO score is going down. And they're once again, you know, and they're part of the problem with the whole um short sailing of homes and all that. And all I'm doing, I pay my mortgage. I pay my car bills. I don't have a nice car, and I'm okay with that because I, I, I'm staying within my means. And why should then I have to pay for other people uh, for other people's mistakes? Because nobody was complaining when they got equity in their house. I understand. I understand how you feel, and I'm like you. I live below my means, though people may find that hard to believe. I'm a man of means, and I do live below my means. Um, I uh, pay my bills. I've got a FICO score over 800. And um, five years ago, six years ago, when people uh, were bidding up the price of houses, uh, I didn't buy a house because I felt houses were overpriced. And they were overpriced because these uh, irresponsible morons were going out there and taking mortgages on houses they couldn't afford. And as a result, bidding the price of every house up. Right. Uh, so I feel your pain. I, I know how you feel. By the same token, I know enough about our financial system to know that if we do not bail out these firms who did wrong, in my opinion, that the entire financial system could collapse like a house of cards. But when will we stop bailing them out? When will this stop? Well, uh, see, here's what you have. You have a president who tells you he's not a tax and spender, who then spends more money than any president we've ever had. He also says he doesn't believe in regulation. So what happens? All the banks and the mortgage companies go nuts knowing that the president uh, has a laissez-faire attitude towards everything. Uh, and it all starts at the top, and the president was opposed to government interference. And this is what you get. It's the Wild West. There is no government interference, and the result of that is we have what we have now. What will ultimately happen is another Democrat will get into office and try to clean up the mess. And when he does, Republicans will call him a tax-and-spend liberal. Right. It, it And it, people can't see this. And uh, this game has been played for years. And the Democratic Party is so lame. They're so unable to articulate. They're so afraid of offending one of their many little pressure groups uh, by saying something politically incorrect that they never actually, uh, you know, have show any balls and say what they should say. Right. Well, Tom, I thank you for your time, and I just wanted to get it out because I'm paying my bills, and I don't see how this is ever going to help me, and I don't believe it will. And and I, I'm okay. I'm a proud person. Well, here's how it's going to help you. The, it could stave off a depression. Ever heard of the depression? No, oh, absolutely. But the thing is, is I didn't cause it. And I, 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 you know, I understand I mean, that you I, didn't I cause it, but it, you, see, no you see, the people who suffered through the depression of 1929, they didn't cause it either. Okay. Right. You're right. And does it really matter who caused it if you're going to have to feel pain? Um. I, yeah. I. I don't know. I don't know. I just know. I just know some people are playing a game, and they're playing a game with my money. And they did it uh, because they knew that the president said we don't want the government to interfere. That would be like pot smokers saying we don't want the police to interfere or child molesters saying we don't want the government to interfere. You know what? Sometimes the government has to interfere. I agree. I, I agree with you. The president is a moron and the whole world knows it. And I, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I would vote for a Republican if somebody agreed with, with my basic principles of being a fiscal conservative and a social liberal. Um, I would. Uh, so I, it's not like I'm some dyed-in-the-wool Democrat. I'm not. Well, I thank you for your time, Tom. I really do. All right, Amy. Thank you for the call. I appreciate it. 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number. It's Derek on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hello, Tom. Hello, Derek. How are you? Great. All right. Um, I remember about a couple years ago you had a, a program to where, uh, like a CSI program, copied something of your show right oh uh, like, there are uh, a number um, of shows that did that right well um well the, the, there's one that i remember that they took a condom or whatever and then they actually made a show out of it i think they're at it again tom uh who's doing it now 
Uh, have you ever heard of the show? It's on uh, CBS, actually. Uh, How I Met Your Mother. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it this season yet, but I've seen it in the past. Okay, so then you're uh, very aware of uh, Mr. Barney Stinson, played by uh, Neil Patrick Harris? Yes. Is that not the good portrayal of you? Well, not really. I mean, uh, sure, occasionally I hear things that sound vaguely familiar. Uh, but um, I don't I don't think of myself when I see that character uh, uh, for the following reason. In reality, that guy is pussified. And uh, on, on any TV sitcom, the characters have to be pussified. Oh, right, right. I mean, because they have to grab ratings. But I would say more or less, I mean, he doesn't believe in marriage, doesn't believe in kids. As a girl, it kicks him out. Um, well, believe it or not, there's, there's a lot of guys who believe in that. They call bachelors. Right, but I, I, I just figured it was uh, a little too much of a coincidence when um, CBS has a show and then a, a, a character... Is really closely familiar to all the rules. That I get more. I you know what? I get more offended when they take words I've created like pussification, uh -huh. and uh -huh. use them in TV shows. Uh, they use the phrase "the pussification of America." I've seen it on various shows, and uh, that was created right here. Uh, really? And, yes. Uh, there are words and phrases that 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 definitely originated here, that end up coming out of the mouths of TV characters all the time. That's right. Actually, I, I remember it was a while ago. You used uh, the pussification of America, right? Yes. Okay. That was you, really? Oh, uh, of course. Pussification. That started here. Oh, that's I, great. I wasn't the first guy to call people pussies. But right. the word pussification, you never heard that. Now, there may have been individuals somewhere who said that, but as far as on a major media outlet, uh -huh. nobody had said that before. Oh, wow. See, because I actually figured that somebody, uh, I mean, because I know it's the parent company, went up to you and said, hey, what do you think if we create, if we create this character? What do you think? Because it really, really resembles a lot that you do. I mean, of course, that has to be downgraded a few, but uh, it really resembles you. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. And again, I, um, I can tell you for sure that uh, nobody came up to me. Nobody asked me. By the same token... There are men who believe in all of those principles, and we commonly call them bachelors. That's the bottom line. 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number. Al on the Tom Like His Show. Hello. Hey, Tom. Nice to talk with you. I know. Yes, you do. I just want to find out what your opinion was on McCain not showing up this evening. I thought he was showing up this evening. I heard that he wasn't going to show up. He wanted to put his... Uh, two cents in back at the Senate, and uh, Obama was the only one that was going to appear this evening. No, that that changed uh, earlier today. Uh, McCain announced that he was uh, going to be appearing at the uh, debate, after all, because Obama insisted. And uh, so I can tell you point blank that uh, McCain will be at the debate tonight. He will. Yeah, I mean, they were saying he wouldn't be, and I guess they were hoping that uh, that Obama would cancel also. But Obama threatened to go and do it alone. So uh, I'm looking at CNN.com right now, and there it is. Final debate preparations underway. Wow. He will be there tonight. Do you think he should have stayed with the debate, or do you think he should have bowed out? Well, this is this is the presidential candidate who said that the economy is his weak spot. Okay. So is it really necessary to have him in there working on the bailout? <laughs> No, I don't think his two cents really matters, to be honest with you. I'm so tired. I'm a Republican, and I'm tired of the Republican Party. Well, uh, you know, again, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm not a liberal or a conservative. So I really feel like a dispassionate observer here. And, you know, they they both are horrible, the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, the difference is that one party says... We're going to raise your taxes, and we're going to spend money on things like health care and education. The other party lies and says they're not going to spend money, but they spend just as much money, if not more, than the Democratic Party. Oh, yeah. It's, it's all hypocritical now. It, it's at the point now where who do you believe? You know, McCain's young. I mean, uh, uh, Obama's young. And, yeah, I'd like to see a new innovation in there, but you honestly believe that McCain can make a change? I think he's just a... Uh, photocopy of what Bush is, and I'm sorry to say that. Well, he is. He wants to keep the Iraq war going, and, uh, exactly. you know, he's perfectly happy with uh, the way things are going. He said the economy is fundamentally strong, 
And is there anybody in the United States who believes the economy is fundamentally strong? Anybody? No. No. And, yeah, you've got the people in, uh, you know, the um, libertarians that actually believe that the, you know, the, the United States is going to stay strong. It's going to, obviously, it's going to rebuild itself. I have no doubt about that. But we can't do it under the regime that we, that we currently live under. Well, uh, the more we allow the dollar to float downward, the less likely it is we're going to get out of this anytime soon. And spending $700 billion to bail out private companies and to give golden parachutes to CEOs is going to devalue the dollar further. And see, that that's another thing that I don't understand. If we can bail out $700 billion to a corporation with the money we're spending on the, uh, on the war right now, how does the United States even afford to do that? You know, just they're not going to do it just by here's, raising taxes. Well, no. Here's how they do it. They do. They, it's the other way of raising taxes, the insidious way of raising taxes. They print more dollars, so they make the existing dollars worth less. Yeah, but I mean, they still have to have the backup on it. I mean, you can print all the paper you want, but if we don't have the financial uh, equity to do that, how does it? How does it even? Well, because what happens is they do it by secretly, quietly, and covertly devaluating the dollar. The dollar's being devalued. And uh, that that is just like when a company issues more stock and they sell more stock. Each share of stock is worth less when companies issue new shares of stock. We shouldn't be printing money to pay our obligations. Outrageous. It's the Tom Likas Show.